But anyway, speaking of biblical, we have a couple of announcements. Speaking like, of what? <laughs> biblical? I oh, don't biblical. know. God, okay. life. Uh, Harry's a grandpa. Woo-hoo. I think he announced it, right? Yeah. But yes, yes. Wallace Schumacher, strong name, born of Harrison and Maddie Schumacher, Saturday night. I'm not sure Harry has his timeline on that right now. <laughs> I think it might have. Yeah, I guess it was. I don't know. I think he texted me Saturday. Anyway, um, super cute, of course. So send your congratulations and your tips to Harry. <laughs> grandpa is officially a grandpa. I know. It's crazy. I can't wait to see what kind of a babysitter he is, right? Like, oh, man. Well, we'll have to wait a few years, I think, because Harry's response to babies is always, you know, I'll see them like right when they're born and then. I'll pick back up with you in two or three years. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know. We need to put a, a camera in the room the first time he babysits. Oh, God. <laughs> Another announcement. If you're going to be in San Antonio next month for the Molson Coors uh, meeting, you are invited to our Drankers meetup. It's Sunday. Yes, Sunday, <laughs> September 8th, 3 to 6 p.m. at a really cool spot called Kariki. Did I say that right, Jordan? Kariki. Kariki. I think Kariki or Kariki. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think yeah, anyone really knows. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly don't. Is that the old Liberty Bar? Is that? What the- yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. They, they did a great job of that. But yeah, it'll be fun to uh, hear all the Molson Coors distributors direct their Ubers or cabs to uh, however they want to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, shit. It's right here on the- <laughs> Read it right here. Um, yeah. And so since it is Sunday, and I know a lot of people are coming in Monday, Rachel Dickens and I have hatched a Miller Lite Drankers Challenge. So if we get, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 people, she and I will slam a Miller Lite and then I'll do like 50 squats in my heels. She's going to plank or something. It's (laughs) great. Tastes great. More planking and squatting. Anyway, if you want to see that, (laughs) you got to come. Is there uh, still room to sign up and get in on the action? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. (laughs) Just email us. Okay, because I think Harry said he wanted to uh, do some exercise too. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that that brings me to another announcement. Uh, uh, Sean Belanger, if you are listening, Jordan came up with the new Voodoo Ranger uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> for the fifty over old white male <laughs> drinker if you guys need to tap into that harry was our inspiration jordan i don't know if you want to maybe explain this new variant yeah this is a new style you could launch into it's a stout um but for harry and you know those afflicted with a similar frustration it would be called imperial gout and, <laughs> <laughs> and the tag the tag what was the tag again this has legs. Oh, yeah. This has legs. <laughs> big, painful, <laughs> big, painful, sore legs. Yeah. <laughs> big, painful ones. Mm-hmm. Get um, elevated while staying horizontal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm listening to this. And y'all are hilarious. Right, Biscuit? Biscuit's, <laughs> Biscuit's laughing so hard she even woke up. Very funny, guys. Chef's kiss. <laughs> Chef's kiss. I forgot about the tag. That's good. <laughs> Uh, so I guess our last announcement before we have our esteemed guest on is, uh, you know, last week or maybe it was two weeks now when we did our D9 pod, Harry was talking about and we're definitely in a recession now. And I think I said, I bet you I know somebody who disagrees. Uh, yeah. That's our own Lester Jones. And so we coerced him to weigh in. And, and Jay, I think you have his his points as to why we are not in a recession, but perhaps a vibe session. Yeah. Harry said he's been predicting a recession for four years and he says it's finally here and he believes the consumer is finally out of stimmy money. Lester responded and said, we are never out of money. Money only changes hands. Who has it, where and when it is spent is what confounds people. He also said (laughs) that recent retail sales data shows that the consumer is not done spending and away from home spending is outpacing at home spending. Um, he goes on to say that we still have net job growth. Unemployment claims are still very low. Job openings are still greater than hires. Debt is still relatively affordable. And the GDP is not contracting. So, Jen, who do you got, Harry or Lester? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, uh, 
Who do you got, Jordan? <laughs> I think I'll go with the actual economist. Economist? The actual the that, economist? Yeah, the yeah. one that hasn't been predicting something for four years that hasn't yeah. turned out. <laughs> Not the armchair expert? No. Uh, all right. You know what? You know what? I'll go with I'll go with Harry. I'll just I'll just tow the company line, right? Hey, if maybe it's four years overdue, you never know. <laughs> yeah. But Lester does tend to be an eternal optimist, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So we'll we will see. But we're about uh, so we're gonna have Jen Hawk on in a second. Oh, and she's entered the waiting room. Perfect That's timing, and she can tell us a little bit of what's happening in the on premise. Hola. Hola. Hey, Jen. How are you? Living the dream every day. <laughs> Jordan, That's the right answer. I don't think I've ever talked to you, but I feel like I know you because I watch the podcast all the time when I'm doing my hair in the morning. <laughs> well, then we do know each other. <laughs> yeah. Nice to uh, to meet you on the podcast now. Likewise. Likewise. And Jen, I told you, unfortunately, our fearless leader is not here, but it's for a good reason. He just had his first grandson, so he's in Houston, and he's away from the studio, doesn't have, have his stuff, but he sends his love, and, you know, he'll probably get um, spit up on, so it's it's cool, right? <laughs> hey, the best things in life right there, so I totally mm-hmm. understand, yes. That's right. That's right. Perfect. Well, let me give you the official BeerNet Radio welcome. I'd like to welcome to BeerNet Radio, Jennifer Hawk. Uh, or Jen, as I like to call her, uh, is the founder and president of Draftline Technologies, the parent company of Draftline Technician Services and Draftline Data. Uh, her company tracks more than a million draft lines and almost 90,000 accounts across more than 40 states. And you have spent the last 30 years working in the on-premise draft category. I mean, you grew up in beer, and we'll talk about that yeah. in a second. Um, but I'm super excited to have you on today, not only to talk about what you're seeing in the on-premise and draft lines, but also we're going to start a new feature powered by draft lines, or several times a week, we are going to show a chart um, that has share of line by market. So we're going to see those trends. It's going to be super interesting. And she'll talk a little bit about that at the end of today's show. But first, let's touch on your company, right? In your words, what would you say you do here, right? Like, what does Draftline oh do? How did it come to be? And what are you guys out there doing in market? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. And I'll try and be as brief as possible. But basically, We work with companies, um, sometimes third-party service companies, lots of times beer distributors. We touch over 800 beer distributors um, directly or indirectly through the service providers where either they're in typically a wholesaler responsibility state. And for us, that means they're responsible by law for cleaning the draft lines Mm -hmm. in their territory. And so... um, golly, where it sprung really was the chemical company that I co-founded with my husband in like 2002. Um, having grown up in Detroit, my dad had a, owned a company for many years that had about 3000 line cleaning accounts in Southeastern Michigan. And so I used to run the crew and we had, um, I don't know, it was almost 30 guys. I think it was about 27 guys and we were operating off Excel. And that uh, was, you know, the eighties into the nineties and some people, Still don't even use Excel today. You know, I'm trying to make that a thing in the past, a thing of the past. But I realize now that um, my dad was an organizational freak, and so if we did not get the draft lines cleaned, we were not making any money on that end of the business. And he did a lot of other things too: equipment installation, um, computerized liquor control, all sorts of things. But it just so happened that nobody really liked dealing with the line cleaners and. So I got that job when I was in high school. (laughs) And so um, went on, married a guy who was in school to get his MBA. And he was like, I don't want to be here in Detroit anymore. We got to get out of here and let's go into chemicals. And so we ended up in Orlando, started a chemical company in like 2002, which now seems like yesterday, but also so long ago. And we partnered with a company called Micromatic which again, I thought my husband, I only married him because I thought he was cute. It turned out (laughs) he's actually really smart. And I was like, Micromatic, who is this company? Like, no way. Because honestly, um, my dad was a Perlick installer back in the day. And those Mm -hmm. two are kind of the big competitors Mm -hmm. um, in the market now. And so partnered with them after we came up with our beer line cleaner and with Micromatic that is, and it was just a match made in heaven, really had the wind behind our back. We supported them. They supported us. It goes on to this day. 
But about 10 years into that, I was, I mean, I wish I could say it was some grand plan, but I literally was about eight months pregnant sitting on the couch. And I was like, I think we need an app. We need an app. Like Mm -hmm. we need a way to track this better because I think people aren't cleaning as much as they should. I know how many accounts this customer says they have for draft, yet they're not buying as much chemical product as they should be. So what's going on? So that app is what became DraftLine, DraftLine mm-hmm. technician specifically. And in the early days, you know, even my father, I always tell this story. Everybody pretty much told me it was the dumbest idea they ever heard. My dad, God bless him, John Solar from Micromatic, who's now retired. <laughs> and let me just say, they all became my biggest fans later when we could prove it could work. But I was getting a lot of biofeedback from people in the industry saying like, Jen, like people have tried to solve for this problem and there's Mm -hmm. no way you're going to do it. But funny enough, you know, everyone I'm related to is a technician, my dad, my brother, my husband. I just have so much knowledge around me for how to, um, you know, get things done and how the real flow of work goes. And so It took me a while to convince a lot of people. And I actually came up with an idea for a recirculating pump, believe it or not, and sold that idea to Micromatic. It's in their catalog. You guys can find it. And that was the seed money for Draftline. Oh, awesome. I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. And so very long story short, um, my husband, who of course was bankrolling this whole thing said, okay, you're going to go out to Chico, California and see if you can get hub draft services to use this. Uh And if it works for him, it'll work anywhere. And um, for anybody who remembers Joe Hub, he's he's still out there, but he's retired. Um, Very tough cookie. And we made it work. And wonderfully, they're still a customer today. But I would say about a year in, we started to realize that the need was bigger than we thought. And so it was one of those things where we kind of measure our success by number of draft lines. And so Mm -hmm. I digress, but to define the universe, Jen, we think there's 1.5 million draft lines in the US. Mm -hmm. Maybe Jordan can tell me different. Nobody (laughs) knows for sure. And so I always always say that in my presentations, I'm like, maybe you're going to tell me something I don't know, but you know, the average number of draft lines is in a location is between eight and Mm 8.9. It fluctuates a little bit, but it doesn't change that fast. And so based on the number of accounts we know in the US and all that kind of stuff, um, we think that that 1.5 to 1.6 million lines is a really good number. So long story short, got to about 250,000 lines and people were like, what? Got to half a million lines. Mm -hmm. They couldn't believe it. Got to 750,000 lines and COVID hit and we took a bit of a dip. But really... COVID for us, it slowed down some of the activity, but the draft line still needed to be cleaned if the accounts were open, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And so then post COVID, um, definitely over a million. And so we think that there is between, you know, that we have about 50 to 50% to two thirds of the overall market for draft that we're tracking. We have focused mostly in the wholesaler responsibility states. So kind of like south of the Mason Dixon line. Um, And that's because of different programs that we've had. And also distributors are just much more systemized and be able, they're able to assimilate, you know, technology a little easier than third party service companies, I would say. So that's, that's where our data comes from. It's literally a man, I say a man in a van, it's a person in a van that goes into an account and there's no, for anybody that doesn't know, there's no barcodes mm-hmm. on kegs. And so you literally have to plug it in. So I have a team of people that help the technicians kind of speed up the tap survey process. They can do photos, they can enter it themselves. Um, but it's, it's definitely a dynamic proposition to get that information in. And we also have a very particular cleansing process that we use that I think helps people use the data. Interesting. To its, its best potential. Yeah. So that's kind of, yep. I don't know where I started on that question, but that's yeah, a rambling no, answer. Yeah. No, it's a good, it's a good um, information, you know, it's a good backgrounder on what it is that is informing this feature that we'll be running, right? And, and the yeah. data that you guys are crunching in the market yeah. that covers the majority of those lines. And so then just to bring it to today, what are you guys seeing out there generally from a very, you know, 30,000 foot view? 
what's gaining on taps, what's or tap oh, lines, goodness. what's losing, you know, and being as gentle well, as possible to these partners. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I was thinking about that a lot is we talk about this all the time as it relates to draft. And we say, you know what? There's opportunity everywhere. Mm -hmm. There is opportunity everywhere. And I'm going to give you some overall numbers for what we're seeing. Yep. And I'm going to say that with the caveat that if you decide to get competitive in your own market, and I've said this before, the national numbers mean nothing to you. Mm -hmm. It depends on what's happening in your individual market. And I would say that's been another real benefit that I've had of the partners that saw um, something, a benefit that we would bring to, the draft line would bring to what they're doing is that they are optimistic about the on-premise and they do believe that on-premise grows off-premise sales and just lifts the whole category. But um, our number one gainer, open lines. Oh, as yeah. usual. And of course, <laughs> I don't have my slides that I can show on this computer. But um, we've had a significant territory increase. And so as we go through some of the data mm -hmm. today, you will see that, um, you know, Anheuser-Busch is growing, and they have a large part of the market. But yeah. I was thinking too, even with Bud Light, mm -hmm. um, that is probably the most important brand that we have in the on-premise. For us, it's still our number one tap handle overall. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you helped me do early on, Jen, is kind of craft the movers and shakers, like what's moving. But Bud Light's ahead by a large margin. However, Open Lines, of course, added um, 9,317 since the beginning of the year. Modelo is the number one actual brand. So for anybody that doesn't know, Open Lines is where there's nothing, the void. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. there's, there's nothing pouring, but Modelo really nicely um, adding just under 7,000 lines. Mick Ultra is number two after Modelo and then Coors Light is number three right after that. And so those all three have some really nice momentum moving into the end of this year. And I would expect that that's probably going to continue. So those are the top three gainers, but you said, but Light is still the very top, you know, brand for share of lines, right? Okay. By a wide margin. Yeah. 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 And so that's where I say too, you know, I think the, in my opinion, the wholesalers, obviously we have a three tier mm -hmm. system and those wholesalers that have been successful in maintaining that market share have had really good outreach to their community in the on-premise. That's really, really important that they're in there. And so Bud Light has held pretty steady. We did have, you know, it took a dip for mm -hmm. sure. And Mick Ultra was switched out at a lot of those locations, but Bud Light currently is still ahead of Mick Ultra for sure. Yeah. I like total to ask number of taps, total yes. number of taps. Yeah. Yeah. Cause everything we're talking about here is share of tap lines, right? Correct. Um, so obviously Mick Ultra was a big beneficiary of the Bud Light fallout, but you know, we talked about uh, Coors Light and Miller Light being a big beneficiary. Has that kind of changed a little bit? Is it accelerating for McUltra versus Miller Lite and so, Coors Light? So I would say the trend line, and I didn't dive deep into the numbers, but the trend line for McUltra is still up. Mm -hmm. um, Bud Light's kind of flattened out. And so it appears that most of those brands have kind of held on to those gains. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Which is really interesting. I was wondering if we were going to see some kind of rebound effect mm -hmm. on that. But um, also Bud Light was bouncing up a little, you know, you don't see the downward trend. So hopefully that means good things. When, when did it kind of start bouncing a little bit? I would say in the spring. Okay. Started to rise up a little bit. I mean, it's not, you know, we're not on a trampoline here, but sure. <laughs> um, tripped <yeah>. upward. <laughs> it, tri it tripped upwards a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it is weird when it's, for me, it's interesting when we dissect individual markets to see, you know, Mick Ultra's now one. Bush Light, I think also mm -hmm. in certain markets has been a nice beneficiary mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. some momentum. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where it's at. But, you know, I, I don't want to see anybody give up on that Bud Light because that's really, really important to draft. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, you were talking about markets and obviously you keep tabs on a lot of them. Um, is there any particular market that fascinates you that you just like look at the 
top standings or see how it has shifted over the years. And you're like, what is going, <laughs> what is going on there? Well, Always checking in. So I think, you know, it's really the thing that's been the most interesting to me as you dissect each market is that the wholesalers that fare well, no matter what's happening with their national brands are ones that really have invested in a nice, strong craft portfolio. Yeah. And they're able to pivot easier should something happen. And I mean, let's be real. There's been more news in draft beer over the last, what, two years, mm -hmm. 18 months than almost ever. I always say everything's been done the same way since 1903, but also uh, supply issues at right. the end of last year affected um, some of our wholesalers. So it's been really interesting to see um, the regionality because like everybody else, I was always looking kind of at the top line numbers. But if you look at North Carolina, the, oh my gosh, the number of breweries and craft brands they have there. I was talking to somebody in Michigan earlier today, you know, Founders is there. That's my hometown originally. Um, Bell's, all sorts of craft brands. Southern California, who knew that there was so much craft in that market? Oh my gosh. It's like um, like hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat in mm -hmm. SoCal with all these brands. It's unbelievable the proliferation there. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we're based off of basically helping companies really capitalize on those known brand advantages in the market so they can go out. I think, Jordan, that we have such a long tail in draft, I think it's something like 60,000 brands that are active. Um, and that's all sorts of flavors. That's from the big boys and, you know, the little tiny craft breweries. Um, the long tail is probably too long, but I see people succeeding kind of at every level within each market. And so that's, the fun thing for me to see that those national numbers don't necessarily reflect in like Kansas city or Des Moines or San Diego or Raleigh. It's really, um, you know, the U S is such a big country overall and the local and regional flavor of wherever you're at is important to that mix. And so that for me is the funnest thing to see. Um, when we had dissected, I think it was 12 different markets. And I think we did this for the beer summit, the beer summit. The only two common brands across all those markets were um, Blue Moon and Bud Light. And one we had to cheat. One was a nine, not 10. And so when you look at how every, and we're in like, I don't know, something probably like 1800 cities. When you look at how the deck shuffles, like you're not dealing with the same deck of cards yeah. when you go from one place to the other. So that's where I say opportunity abounds mm -hmm. if you can be a smart operator. Well, just real quick on something you said there, um, you know, you mentioned the long tail might be too long and then we have open lines still gaining. So how do we kind of rationalize what's going on out in the marketplace? So let's talk about that because when I did the summit and Jen, I can't remember where you found me. <laughs> but I was so nervous. And she asked me to come and speak at the beer summit. And um, as soon as I got off stage, some smart Alex said to me, those open lines are dead. That's not an opportunity. So of course, the first thing I do, and I'm sure he's probably listening to this podcast, I can't remember his name. But um, the first thing I did when I got back to the office is I told the analyst, I said, find out how much activity is on those open lines. God damn it. I probably can't <laughs> swear. But and oh, so it turned out. It turned out 55% of the open lines were cycling product between a week and 90 days. And so mm -hmm. what's that tell you? They're not actually dead. Right. So pre-COVID, we had 44,000 lines. I can't remember exactly what our total line count was that we were tracking. We now have more lines and it's 101,000. It's about doubled, if that makes sense, from the pre-COVID days. Now, we're also coming off of um, what I call the last draft super cycle, which is basically a massive proliferation of lines that started, you know, I was born in the mid seventies and we had about 300 breweries in the U S we now have about 10,000 in 1982, Ken Grossman brews his first beer 
few years after that, we have the introduction of the slim keg. Okay. So the 20 liter keg, our refrigerators didn't get bigger, but we were like popping in more tap handles everywhere we could go. Right. And to make more space and provide more variety. So when it comes to the, and I think we've capped out on that. I think we have capped out our refrigerators cannot handle any more kegs of beer, but I think that the consumer wants a lot of that variety. So when you look at open lines, what, what is the, the genesis or the cause of the open lines? Some of it is the retailer got burned during COVID and they don't want to bring as, in as much product. There's definitely some, but that number is really close to what it was pre-COVID. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there were just empty tap handles out there. So I don't know that that's um, earth shattering. The other thing is, Sometimes they're bringing craft brands. They don't have as enough um, product that they have sold into that location. And so it's turning out. So for us, we always say the natural state of a, a tap or a draft line is to be pouring beer. And so you want to figure out what those reasons are within your particular territory. But those open lines are low hanging fruit opportunities to go and find some placements for sure. Mm-hmm. And um, you don't even have to knock your competitor off. It's really easy. We have this psychology I have learned within beer is that um, the retailer wants to be fair. So there's this, I'm trying to be fair Mm -hmm. comparison. So if there's three wholesalers that call on me, it's a third, a third, a third for that draft system. And so you want to go out and be conquesting and out, get an outsized share of that Mm -hmm. draft Mm -hmm. system for sure. Are those open lines low hanging fruit for like beyond beer plays? Do you think, or do you think? Okay. Well, so this is, I have a lot of thoughts on the beyond beer products, which Mm -hmm. we're working on all that gen. So we'll, we'll do some things on that later. I'm sure. Um, Overall, when we had looked at it at the end of the, of last year, I think we had about 10,000 beyond beer products, Mm -hmm. right? And that would be excluding cider. I think we're somewhere around 25,000 lines of cider across the US. And this is like end of last year numbers. So I don't know where it's at exactly today. I would I would think it hasn't changed drastically. I think that draft brings wonderful opportunities for those beyond beer products, speed of service, you know, the LFG lifestyle, like hurry up, let's go. You can still put a garnish on there and make it look as pretty as it can possibly be. I think that there's a lot of profit across every tier for those Beyond Beer products. So I love to see it mixed up, you know, Mm -hmm. chains like 60 Vines popping Mm -hmm. up with all wine on tap. Um, I think that it's great. I think it's great, especially with, you know, the struggle with the workforce and having people show up, you know, draft right. offer offers a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Well, and let me, you know, kind of go back. You were kind of talking about trends pre COVID into now. Now I know in some measurements year over year, we're doing a little bit better, you know, if in some measurements yeah. on premise, but I would say pre COVID, the idea is that draft and the on premise for beer is not what it was, right? What, what's your take on what's happened? What's the way forward? I mean, do, are we just kind of right sizing or, or what's, what's going on there? So that's, I love that you asked that question. So I think that people and organizations are either deciding that they want to get competitive or saying like, they don't want to deal with draft at all. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like two sides of the coin. And there are some in the middle that say, I would love to be doing more. I'm just not sure what the next step is. And so this is, again, back to Jordan's question about dissecting kind of each market. What I've been working on the last 18 months is case studies to prove, you know, kind of urban myths that have existed within beer. Does the on-premise really drive off premise sales? Mm -hmm. Um, And so... While we hear a lot of negativity about kind of trends overall, I would say that when we're working with clients in individual markets, we have one that was up over 17.5% on draft last year. And that wasn't just a direct correlation to anything catastrophic happening last Mm -hmm. year. It was they got really busy. And so what's been fascinating to me is that 
the sales process on the wholesaler side has not been more systemized. I suppose mm-hmm. too, it's why I have an opportunity to do mm-hmm. something with the data because people weren't doing it before. And it is a lot of work mm-hmm. to kind of manicure it, get it into a sales process. And so, you know, there have been reports of draft was up, you know, what was it? $500 million. Um, some of that's probably been taken back, clawed back mm-hmm. over the last few months with some negative numbers. But mm-hmm. what I can tell you for certain is that if you break it down to a distributor that wants to get busy, they can pick up more market share than they had pre COVID. Mm-hmm. And we talked too about draft beer overall is somewhere around changing tiers from the, um, distributor to the retailer, those Mm -hmm. sales are about $9.2 billion, $3 billion bigger than the movie industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got to decide how much of that slice that they want to go after, which takes a little bit more investment up front. But the people I'm looking at are going up unopposed almost in their markets and really cleaning up. Yeah. So uh, that's the that's sort of your, you know, the national numbers aren't so great. But again, for anybody that wants to get busy in their market, we're seeing massive, massive results, which yeah. is really cool. Yeah, yeah. And your clients, I'm curious, just sort of, sort of hot topics this year, what are they concerned about? What are they asking you about? Well, I, you know, for me, they always come to me about quality issues. Mm-hmm. And, and how do I get more efficiency out of my technicians and things like that? Um, also, how to approach sales. And, you know, we talk about this sometimes too, when you're a monopoly, you mm-hmm. haven't traditionally had to worry about outperforming someone else because right. you're a monopoly. And so if they <laughs> want a particular product, they have to come to you. And so sharing very creative ways um, to look at their specific brand advantages, because that's the other fascinating thing about the way a wholesaler's territory has developed over time, no two are alike, Mm -hmm. unless you're a wholly owned distributor, right, by a supplier. And so it's like these puzzle pieces that you have to put together. Efficiency, data Mm -hmm. integrity is a big one to make Mm -hmm. sure that the data is coming in and we're feeding good things to Mm -hmm. their wholesalers. But I think too, um, really reading the data on brands that are declining within their market. And so in any given market, there's like thousands, hundreds to thousands of brands that are on the downswing. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about the long tail. Those are all typically in that long tail. And for growth, it's easy to attack those brands as opposed to go after going after your biggest competitor, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say also some of the brand acquisitions Mm-hmm. Tilray, like Tilray, for example, mm-hmm. I was on a meeting last week with a wholesaler and they're like, oh my God, I love, I can't remember which brand it was in particular, but he goes, we love that brand. I can't lose that brand. You know, yeah. this is, this is pivotal for me. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of movement, a lot of uncertainty. Those, yeah. those are kind of the big, yeah, the big things we hear. Yeah. Real quick. And then I know Jordan probably has a few more have you guys seen, cause obviously Tilray just struck for Molson Coors brands, the last of 10th and Blake, but it's been a year since they bought a whole bunch of AB craft brands. Have you seen anything in the data as to how that acquisition has moved things on, on draft lines at all? I mean, so you've got, you've got all, you know. I did not look, but shock top was up a bit. And that mm-hmm. was something that was a brand that they gave up on before mm-hmm. that acquisition. Mm-hmm. And that was a really important brand for a lot of wholesalers that we worked with. Some mm-hmm. of them couldn't even get it as mm-hmm. I recall. Um, so shock top was up. I'll have to dive into those numbers more, Jen. I did not look before this call, but I think it's a super interesting strategy. Yeah, it is interesting. I think a lot of us are, are still trying to wait and see, you know, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> and also kind of cobbling together a network. I mean, honestly, it reminds mm-hmm. me a little bit about what I did with Draftline as far as mm-hmm. the thing that's probably irreplaceable with Draftline is the network yeah. that came together you know, not just through the distributors, but through the service company companies. And so if they go that route and, yeah. you know, they pack on some other products, I think it could be really, really interesting, you know, but it all depends on, can they really deliver on those relationships mm-hmm. and make those 
distributors happy while they work through the other things. But yeah, I mean, that one, um, I think it was about 2% of lines went mm. from AB to Tilray. So right away that put them up to, you know, a top 10 brewery. Yeah. That was weird or supplier, yeah. I should say. <laughs> You know, that's something you don't see. And now Molson Coors is going to do that. And Molson Coors is sitting at about 10% of overall tap handles. And so I'll have to pull and see Um, those brands. I don't think were quite as big as the ones from the first acquisition. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, back to the markets that they're in where they're performing well. They do well for those distributors. So, yeah. Did you, just since we're talking about this, uh, any trends on Blue Moon? Because I know that's something that Molson Coors is really trying to drive. And I didn't look at that one. Let's okay. See. No. Sorry, I should have prompted you on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I can look that up. I mean, this is what I can say about Blue Moon, though, for sure, is that that was the one that was consistent across every top 10 market that we looked okay. at. Yeah. And or top 10 brands in every market that we looked at, we think Blue Moon is a great opportunity. It's a great mm-hmm. product um, for the distributors that have it, for the supplier, Molson Coors that makes it. And so it's probably one of the most consistent brands that we see right. from market to market. And so, yeah, if I was betting on what I was going to back, I would do something with that brand for sure. Mm-hmm. It's got a lot of appeal across the country. You know, I'm curious with your expertise and draft and your knowledge of, you know, all the inner workings, um, you know, non-alc beer is something that people are pushing for, but still haven't really figured out. Do you think we're going to figure that out anytime soon? Well, funny enough, I was talking to my dear friend, Megan Anderson, who is at Sam Adams um, a number of years ago, and she started a program called Aficionado. And it's all about, um, it's basically certification. It's kind of like Cicerone for non-alc products. And so I think the concern right now is the bacteria load that could Mm -hmm. be present in a draft system. And so let's just say that we're trying to make some plans. (laughs) to make sure that we can dispense those products. And, you know, I think she had said that non-out craft picked up like 7%. I don't know if that's absolutely correct, but that was just a number that they looked at um, last week. I think it's a great offering again, beyond beer. It's, I guess it's still beer, Right. Right but I think it's a great product offering. And we have this little brewery that my husband and I go to tactical brewing in Baldwin park where we live and it's running clubs and it's like all these healthy people Mm -hmm. coming in and they still want to drink beer. beer, Right. And so it seems to me that that would be the perfect extension Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. to add to some of these product lines. Mm -hmm. And so while will it ever be as big as the other stuff, who knows, But I think, too, could that have more stickiness than some of the other things that we've seen come and go on draft? Heck, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. For sure. Um, And then just one more kind of looking at the market. You know, we talked a little bit about Modelo uh, at the beginning, Mm -hmm. and we know its size in the off-premise. But Constellation Brass, you know, they talk about it's nowhere near as big in the on-premise and still has so much more run room. Yeah, uh, Is that what you see in your data too? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I looked up um, the breweries gaining share the fastest in 2024 and Constellation's number one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Modelo overall, I didn't dive in to look at where that's at aside from it's the number one brand actually gaining in the on-premise. I mean, my understanding is they didn't have draft for a while for some yeah. of yeah. these products. So that yeah. wouldn't have been in my purview at all. And so I think that it's going to be super interesting to see if they continue to be competitive in draft um, to see what that can do to help grow that brand. Because, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, Jordan, urban myths that I'm trying to prove, like to have a wonderful on-premise experience with the, the beer or whatever product tasting as the brewer intended um, 
that's going to help drive cases in the off premise. I've mm-hmm. never seen that not work out. And so we have some small case studies that we've done in regards to that. But with the people as smart as they are over at that company, I'm assuming, yeah, that if that's the focus, that's great. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's going to pay dividends. Yeah. This is a good segue from the last podcast that Harry had with Bill Hackett. It's perfect. Listen to him in a row. I listened, yeah. <laughs> well, it was funny. I listened to that this morning. Yeah. Uh, like I said, um, and I thought, gosh, you know, the thing that really struck me about him is just the common sense. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, I'd love to say that this is all rocket science, but the reality is, is we're not putting men on the moon here. Yeah. And it really is a common sense I believe it's still a relationship driven business. I know some of that has changed, but when I look at my wholesalers that did well through, you know, all the happenings of last year, it was the one that had the strong relationships in the market. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that still translates today. Things are, you know, technology advances in some ways, things are becoming more impersonal payment platforms, you know, ordering platforms and all those Mm -hmm. sorts of things. But I made a decision a long time ago to, you know, double down on the people in the vans going into the locations because um, kind of service is the sales lane where, Mm -hmm. you know, technicians, even if you don't have an on-premise rep going in, even if you've moved them to, um, you know, tell sell or whatever kind of route, Mm -hmm the draft line cleaner still gets a big hug usually when he's coming in. And so he's a great representative for that wholesaler in those locations. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's um, kind of talk about the new feature we're going to be running from you guys powered by draft line several times a week. We're going to have, you'll start seeing a little chart at the end of the newsletter and that will be from our good friend, Jen here, her company talking, you know, with the top brands and their share by line. And of course, in most market open lines will be the number one. <laughs> yeah. One, right? two or three typically. Right. Yeah. 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 So what, what else yeah. can you share about just so when people see that they understand what they're looking at? Yeah. So basically we have a lot of overlap. So we're tracking from service companies and distributors and we take that data and we slice it down to a given city. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to Jordan's question about, what's it look like? I wanted people to see that it's not all about those top line national numbers. And so this is something you and I, Jen, had talked about for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an optimistic view, too, when you look at um, the hyper local and regional brands that are in those top 10s. That's something good for craft specifically. I don't think craft's going away. I think we've just got, we've got to get more efficient. And so um, it's an amalgamation of our data. It is down to a city and you can kind of look in and see what the most popular top 10 list. And again, it's by number of tap handles is in your particular market as we feature those. And I would say too, it's by percentage because total number of tap handles is one thing, but it doesn't really give it any scope. So right. we wanted to look at percentage of tap handles in any given city. And I think it'll be a lot of fun for people to see. I um, have had some people, I think it was Adams when we were at the beer summit, they're like, we know that that was our market because Sycamore was on there. Uh, and, you know, yeah. so it's kind of a fun thing to look at. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting too, because, you know, we'll start, we'll start with a set of cities and then we'll cycle through them and then we'll kind of repeat eventually, you know, and so you can yeah. see kind of what, if anything moved and that sort of thing. So I think it's going to be really great and we're super appreciative to have this. Oh, sure. Guys. So thank you. Yeah, It'll I be can't fun. Wait to get my hands on this. So I think we need to, at some point too, as it starts to come up, that's been the biggest challenge for us is that it's new data. People don't mm-hmm. usually look at data like this. So we're working through, you know, the uses of that always. But I think at some point we probably should look at some regionality yeah. as it relates to what brands are doing what. I mean, we have right. seven regions in draft line that we operate, but I think that would be pretty insightful. And hopefully yeah. I'll be a little more prepared for some of those questions, Jen. Oh, you're totally prepared. <laughs> no, you're you're typical female leader. You want to do everything perfectly. You did great. Yeah, well. <laughs> There you you can't go. prepare for absolutely everything. Like it's just not yeah. possible. So 
So anyway, yeah. <laughs> hey, like it's better than making ticker. something up, you know? <laughs> oh, dear. That's the one. You There's know, plenty of people who do that. Yeah. Well, in the early days, I remember the best piece of advice I ever got. It was actually from my husband and I was going on a chemical sales call to Diageo in at St. James Gate, which I thought would be much taller when I got there. <laughs> but I said to him, oh my gosh, what if I don't know the answer? If they ask me a question, he goes, I don't know is a valid answer. And they'll yeah. have a lot more respect for you if you tell them that as opposed to making something up. Yep. And he was right. He was yep. right. So yeah, totally. for sure. Totally. Funny. Well, awesome. Well, Jay, you have anything else? I thought that was super thorough and, and awesome and a great introduction to what people are going to be seeing in the newsletter. So yeah, no, that's it for me. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thank you for the incoming data. Very, very Absolutely. excited about that. Yeah. yeah, it's been a long time coming. We're excited to work with you. And anything we can do to promote draft, um, we're happy to do. So thanks no for doubt. having us, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Take Jay. Care. I'll see you soon. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. Bye, everyone. <laughs>